on, and the first section is on interventional ultrasound. And it's really a great pleasure to be able to start this session with three renowned speakers. First, we have uh, Dr. Christian Olse, then we have Dr. Farm from Bergen. And uh, my co-chairman is uh, Professor um, Roald Havre. Is he arrived? Not yet, but hopefully he will soon arrive. So we will start with the first lecture. And that is uh, by uh, Associate Professor at Copenhagen University, Christian Nolse. He is also a doctor, radiologist at Kyrgyz Hospital in Copenhagen. And for those of you who know him, he is a man who really knows how to do interventions. He really pinpoint diseases in the abdomen by using ultrasound as guidance. Roald, the seat is for you there, please. So it's a great pleasure to have you here to start our webinar. So please uh, come forward, Christian. Your anniversary. It is a great pleasure for me to be back in Norway. I've been here many, many times uh, in uh, Denmark and Norway are said to be so-called sister countries. And you have to be careful in these days of gender equity because sister, I mean, what about the brother countries is called Broderland, which means brother country. So we have it all. Anyway, I'm, I'm very happy to be back here. And I have been here many times before. I looked into my calendar and I see that actually I was here on exactly the same institute 10 years ago to celebrate the 10 years anniversary of NCUG. And also I think it was a symposium in honor of founder and professor, past professor, um, Svan Udegaard. And so I looked into my calendar and I saw that maybe the title we came up with is not adequate. It should have been made. So we call that fusion and uh, different other names on it. This is the case we had on uh, pancreatic multicystic lesion. Here it is, a, a CT ultrasound, actually serious fusion. Uh, and you can see it on the still picture here. On the contrast agent, nothing is going on. And actually, or actually also on the CT, you don't see much but a lesion, a uh, high, high potent lesion. Uh, when you put on just ultrasound, you can see there are uh, some things in there. A, a little, uh, maybe some septations. With contrast, not much uptake. And on CT, still just a high potent mass. With ultrasound, carefully looking with contrast agent, you can actually see the septations. You can watch and you can see singular bubbles. So that's very impressive. You can tell with CU's ultrasound, this is not just a cyst. This is something more than a cyst because there is some live tissue in there. We didn't really know what it was. It was a small suspicion of could it be a cyst adenoma. It didn't really look like that or a carcinoma. We tried to take a biopsy. This is about biopsy and intervention and only blood came out. It turned out to be at surgery at a huge hemangioma, a very strange thing. So it's not that fusion ultrasound helped a lot, it's just to show you what is this about and also uh, what can you actually uh, achieve with it. And just to emphasize, it is so impressive what you can do with contrast agents. These little bubbles, they represent structures the size of a red blood cell. So that is really impressive. Anyway, this is not just a webinar about um, about ultrasound. It is also an anniversary in the honor of the 20 year you have been functioning as a national center of ultrasound and gastroenterology. So uh, on behalf of Wolfram, I am in my capacity as past president of Wolfram, I would like to wish you a huge congratulation for, for this. And this congratulation also comes from the Danish Society of Diagnostic Ultrasound because we have a lot Together we have done, we have run, for instance, a, a Eurosound Congress together back in, I don't remember, many years ago. But, uh, and this is the current uh, president of, of our society. Uh, also, also, another president of our society, Caroline Eversen, she is now the president-elect of EFSUMP. And on this table, we are sitting in a place far from here. We are sitting in Africa running a course in collaboration with NCUG and uh, Wafump. And as you can see, the chairman, uh, the current chairman is right here, Otelke is sitting there. And Wafump, we run 
20 centers of education around the world. And many of these has been run, the courses we run there has been run in collaboration with NCUG. Also, a congratulations from Harlow Hospital, where I've worked for 35 years. And the people there, you know, uh, some of you know them, uh, Torben, Lorenzen, Bjørn Skjoldby, and the old gentleman down here, he is not with us anymore. This is not really working. But he is in here because he is the father of interventional ultrasound, Professor Hans Henrik Horn, my mentor, and this talk is about interventional ultrasound. Okay, why should we congra congratulate NCUG? Well, for your huge contribution to the scientific and educational activity in ultrasound. You have been uh, producing ultrasound textbooks. You have also been involved in the greater uh, Wolfram production of huge textbook. You have produced hundreds of scientific articles focused on ultrasound. And you just heard the numbers from Ott Helge. But uh, also you have put your influence on the guidelines on how to do ultrasound in gastroenterology and in ultrasound in general. So it's not, just about, it's, it's not just about the numbers of, of articles, it's also about the change of way we think. We have, you have influenced that. And you have educated us through courses. I've been here several times for Eurozone schools, where you have provided education for people from all over Europe. And I have to say, this has always been very cozy, and uh, I love coming back. So this is last time, not last time, this is the place we went you took us far out in the ocean to a, to a restaurant called Cornelius. It was a very, very wonderful experience. So there was one thing we didn't do together, and that was Eurosun in 2020. I feel so sorry for you. I know how much you prepared for it, and I feel with you this is... Uh, but this is the way it is. We cannot control that. We know it would have been a fantastic event. More than this, our symposium is also a tribute, I understand, to Professor Trygve Hausken. I'm sorry I have not known you personally, but I know that you are famous for one thing I love, and that is soup. <laughs> so, <laughs> but aside from that, I looked into the Scopus to see who you are. I must say I'm really impressed. You have achieved a lot. You have contributed a lot with a huge age index and a huge number of pr scientific productions. So I don't know if it, if it is a jubilee when you become a retiree. I don't know. But uh, yeah. you, have, you have achieved a lot. Congratulations. So this is beautiful Bergen. And I'll turn a little bit south to Denmark, where I work. Uh, now, fusion uh, ultrasound is a virtual thing. It's about reality and virtuality. And so is this picture. This is where I work now. I work at Herlu, not at Herlu Hospital. I worked there 35 years. I work at this hospital. And this picture is actually a virtual picture because this is how it's going to look in a few years from now. The white thing is the structure they are building right now. I work in a department of surgery, one of the biggest in Denmark. I'm a radiologist. I do interventional ultrasound in a surgical department. The chairman of our huge department, he's a gastroenterologist. Now this tells me something about that the times they are changing. We, don't, we are not hooked up in little boxes anymore. We can work across the professional lines and we should do that. So let's go straight on. What is fusion and how does it work? This picture is from the Faroe Islands. And uh, I took it because I, my father was from there. So I've been there many times. The Faroe Islands, as you all know, they lie out in the ocean, just straight west of Bergen, actually, in between Berg, uh, Iceland and, and Norway. So this is a, a map, geographical map, so we can see where Faroe Island is. You know that. But if you want to know more, if you are going sailing, for instance, you would like to know more than just where are the Faroe Islands. You also know how is the weather forecast. It could be dangerous in the North Atlantic. So when you put this information on top of the geographical information, you have a fused image. This is very helpful, for instance, because you can see here where Faroe Islands is there. You have to be careful because a storm is coming in from up there. You could catch information also when you do CU's ultrasound, ultrasound CT fusion. You can get information from the other modality that you can use in what you are doing. This is what I'm talking about. So fusion ultrasound, you have ultrasound on the left, CT on the right. You do it real time, you will see that the only real thing here is the ultrasound. The CT is just following you. So this is not really going on now. This is a 
previous captured CT scanning loaded into the ultrasound scanner. But you can see exactly what structures on ultrasound, what they do represent on CT. So you can, for instance, see this classification. What do you need? You need an ultrasound equipment that is capable of doing fusion. So we need to have a magnetic uh, transmitter and receiver in the system. You don't have to think much about that. You do have to have a CT, MRI, PET-CT, or something else with a transverse imaging of the same patient. This can be achieved uh, one day before, one hour before, or two years before. It doesn't matter if it's the same patient, and you can load them into the system. Then you just have to connect the transmitter, and you have, when you have the images up, you have to tell the computer, this is the identical plane. So here we have pancreas and pancreas, and so we, we all can agree now we are aligned you can go on scanning. And you can scan the real-time color Doppler, for instance, and you can see the colors is not in the CT, but you can see how the CT is following all along. So you can do any kind of ultrasound technique, and you can fuse it with CT, MRI, what you like. You can present them side by side as an overlay in different scales, up to you. So here we have a case of follow-up for a patient who had REF, uh, IF ablation of a liver metastasis, you can see it on the CT here. Sorry, it's not running. Why is it not? It should run. Anyway, um, what we have is now ultrasound is the master. You are scanning, and the CT has to follow. So the CT is the slave. So all you see on the ultrasound, you can identify on CT what was that or what is it. This can be used for very good uh, reasons. You can um, use it with PET-CT, or you can use it with MRI, like these ones. Uh, and here we had a lesion that was very inconspicuous on, on PET. You could see it on PET, but not on ultrasound. We took a biopsy. Another lesion here we took guided by MRI, and it came out with colon cancer and angiocarcinoma. So let me go you through a, how this could work. Here's a case with a pancreatic cancer, pati patient with a tumor in the pancreas, and also liver metastasis. So we do a liver biopsy. You don't need, here we don't need the fusion for anything, but it's just fun to look at. You could easily do it without. But just to show you, of course, you don't see the needle. The needle is only on ultrasound, not on the CT. Then we take a biopsy from the pancreas. You can see the lesion in the pancreas is here, on CT here. Now, when you do the biopsy, you can appreciate that the, the needle is in the pancreatic lesion and it's moving up and down. Of course, the CT is not moving because the CT is history not going on for real now. What can we, this is just to show how it works. What can we use it for? Well, sometimes we have so-called invisible or maybe just not very conspicuous lesions that we get referred to ultrasound. Can you please take a biopsy or can you please do an ablation? But you don't see it in ultrasound or you see it vaguely. It's not really visualized. What do you do? Well, you could try using fusion and CS. So here's a case. This patient had a previous history of both colon and breast cancer. And there was a mass sitting on the CT very high in the dome of the right liver. You can imagine, if you know ultrasound, this could be difficult to see on ultrasound. And indeed it was. It's, it's somewhere up there because it is up under the diaphragm. You don't see it. We added ultrasound contrast agent. And it's not that the contrast agents will not show it for you, but it makes it more conspicuous. If you look carefully at this, up here, you can see when the patient breathes, the lesion comes into vision. You can actually see it. Uh, so uh, being comfortable that it was really there, we went ahead and we took a biopsy. And you can see the biopsy, the needle coming in there. Uh, so it, it appears that the, the, the videos doesn't run more than just one time. Even I asked them to run the whole thing. OK. OK, but so okay, here we have then, so just to show that we had because we had fusion and seals, we were able to take a biopsy from something we would not have taken a biopsy from. And it came out that this was a metastasis from, her, um, from her, one of her cancers. Her, I can't, it was from her breast cancer. And this is important because obviously she will receive different chemotherapy, whether it's from the colon cancer or from the breast cancer. So it's very important. And a biopsy would not have been taken if we hadn't had this. 
This has been uh, showed in a beautiful paper uh, some years ago from Korea. They had a total of 711 biopsies they wanted to take. Most of them they just went ahead and took with ultrasound if it was possible to see. And then they added fusion if they couldn't see and if they could do it, they were happy. If they could still not do it, they had 16 inconspicuous lesions left. Uh, and with those they added fusion. Now because they had see, uh, fusion with sears, they were able to see 15 of these 16 and they could take a biopsy and get to a conclusion. So the added value of fusion and CUs is invaluable. It's a very, very good tool for difficult cases. Another, um, another invisible lesion could be an abscess. You may ask, what is it talking about? How can an abscess be invisible or inconspicuous? Well, it can. What is inside an abscess? Pus. What could also be there? Air. So if you have air in an abscess, you will not see it in ultrasound. Or I mean, you would only see the air. This is such a case. Here we have a post cholecystectomy patient with fever, and this is where the, the, um, the gallbladder was. There's only air. Well, we did a CT, ultrasound, and fused it, and you could see the air in there was in a cavity and probably an abscess. So, but you couldn't see it in ultrasound. Knowing that behind this air, there is actually an abscess. I was able to drain this abscess, putting in my needle and putting in a catheter and irrigate uh, on the catheter and drain the abscess. I would not have done that as comfortable if I would not have seen that behind this air was the abscess. So that is a good indication for fusion drainage uh, of a uh, fusion intervention. Another indication could be biopsy from viable areas. Why is that? To, to avoid necrotic areas, because if we take a biopsy from necrosis, we will not get the diagnosis. So here is a, case, uh, a fusion CT ultrasound. You see a lesion here. Uh, well, you don't know where it is on the ultrasound, but on the CT, you can see it's close to the stomach and uh, a lot of uh, bowel around and the mass is sitting close up here. So it's a peritoneal mass of tumor. Um, we did a guided biopsy and it was easy, very easy to take the biopsy. You don't need fusion for that. Unfortunately, the biopsy was also negative. Easy biopsy because of necrosis. So what do you do? Well, you look at the serious fusion and you take your biopsy guided by the serious. Here you have uh, the lesion. You can see necrosis is here. This is perfused. This is where you would like to take so here we have up here, you see the tumor, it has necrosis in the center. Uh, the biopsy is taken from perfused area. So the point is, always biopsy enhanced or perfused, which is also the same as viable areas. Because if you don't do, you get necrosis. But also remember, never, never biopsy non-viable, non-enhanced or non-perfused areas. Why would you? Have because you would only get necrosis. So this is a case of the opposite. This is a follow-up of a patient who had microwave ablation of a liver metastasis. You can see the ultrasound here. You can see there is a lesion. This is a CT. Actually, we did our ablation very, maybe too good, because it went all the way up through the muscle layers. It does happen, but it's not a catastrophe. The patient get a burn. But on, uh, nothing here, but on, this, on the ultrasound, you could be suspicious. Is this still viable tissue? So we did uh, this fusion, you can see, with contrast agent, fusion, serious ultrasound, serious CT, I mean, you will be able to see there is no take up of contrast in this lesion. So all we see is necrotic tissue. It is just maybe a clot, maybe necrosis, but it's not viable tissue, so don't take a biopsy from that. The last and the big, the best, maybe one of the best indications for doing fusion and serious is in any work related to ablation, percutaneous ablation. To do that, you need to know another feature that is also uh, connected with fusion. This is what we call GPS, very similar to the GPS you have in your car or the one I used to walk over here from the hotel today. So what does it do? It makes you able to point at a point on the image and the computer will remember it. So here we see the, um, uh, the portal vein from a subcostal and from intercostal view and you can put a marker on so you know, well, it's the same vein. Looking here, you see one metastasis and looking from the upside, you see the same metastasis 
and there's a number on it because you put a one, so you know it. If you have the way it works is that the further you get away from your point, the point will become into a square. So you know if you are at the right track or not. Here we have a case with two metastases and you put a number of each of these and you can see this is number one and there is a cyst and then here comes number two. So it helps you keep a track of your metastases. Important if you are going to ablate them. So here is how it works. Uh, the patient is in the OR for an ablation. Um, so we will do a CUCT fusion and GPS guided RF ablation. Sounds, uh, it's, diff it's more difficult to say than it is to do. Um, you have, uh, here is a CUCT fusion. You have the CUs here and you have the lesion there. We then put a GPS marker on it. Now this marker is interactive. Remember, it remembers where the lesion is. So we go ahead and do it live. Um, we take the CUs away and we use only uh, B mode. Here comes in the needle and you can see the marker is here and if I move a little bit you will be able to see that it becomes to a square. It has to be a point. So when it is correctly in place, we this is an old RF with the prongs coming out. You can see the prongs coming out. You can actually see them coming out. So now we are in the right place and we do the RF and once the RF is over, we do immediately, while the patient is on the OR, we do a CUS to see if it's all ablated, if it's all killed. And to this patient, there was some take up of contrast. So immediately we do a reablate in the same setting. And after that, a second CUS to confirm that now it seems to be all ablated. So we are happy. Okay, we have done this uh, for, for many years. Actually, this is just a small fraction we have written up here. We have done close to 1,000 metastases, and we have a huge uh, success rate technically. Not that all patients are cured, but technically for the metastases, it's very good. Uh, we are not the only ones to say that. There was this paper from China where they used fusion imaging and contrast ultrasound to do ablation. They had a total of 70 lesions they wanted to ablate. With ultrasound alone, they could identify only 25 of the 70 lesions conspicuously. I wonder why only 25, but this is what they write. But then when they added fusion, they were able to see 49 of these 70 lesions and they could ablate them. Still, not all of them. Then they added CUs to their fusion and they could have a success rate of 95 or almost 96%. 67 out of 70 lesions they were able to ablate with a combination of fusion and CUs. So, and a very good completion uh, rate. Am I running? How is the time? Five minutes. Okay. L I will be done in five minutes. So um, let's jump to another. This is, was microwave ablation, and this is very good to use, uh, CUs and fusion. In, in, in straightforward cases, you don't need it. If you see the lesion, go ahead and do it. You do need CUs, though. When you are done, you have to check that the ablation is done. Back to the ward. Another ablation system is what we call NanoKnife. Uh, it is has become, has been attracting a lot of uh, interest in pancreas, and you do pancreas here. It's been a very uh, important um, new technique in ablation of inoperable pancreatic cancers. So uh, what it works by is, it's not heat, it's not cold, it is simply electric current. It is high voltage between one and two kilo volt, and uh, it is called irreversible e electroporation. You have to stick in not one needle, but sometimes up to six needles. It looks a little bit dramatic, and each time there is an le electric pulse, you would see how the whole thing moves, and the patient jumps. Uh, he doesn't. He must not jump. So the patient is totally on curare. He is totally relaxed, and it's a difficult anesthesia. You you do need fusion to do this because when you are sticking six needle into the pancreas, you want to avoid all these very very important structures in there, not only the blood vessels, but also the tubular structures. And NanoKnife prevents destruction of tubular structures. It does not destruct the colidocal duct or the pancreatic duct because it only kills cells. And structures like arteries, ductal, uh, colidocal duct or pancreatic duct, they do have a lining of endothelium, of course. But they also have the main wall is made of collagen, of proteins, and that is not denaturated by uh, electric pulse. So after the, the treatment, the, the intimal lining just 
grows in back and the patient should be able to live on. It can be similar to if you throw an atom, uh, atomic bomb over bourbon, it will all be out. Nobody can use anything. But if instead you use a nuclear bomb, whoever's thrown it could come back in and take all the structures because only people would, only living tissue would die. A nuclear bomb would not take down buildings. This is the same. Nanolife doesn't kill, uh, doesn't uplit, uh, doesn't kill the, the, the structures, tubular structures, only the cells. So, uh, and it looks, um, and we can actually do ablation and it is beautiful, but unfortunately the patient doesn't survive. There is a paper, one of the most experienced in this field is an um, American surgeon, Rob Martin, and he um, has published a lot on it. And his best cases, he has a median overall survival of close to 24 months, which is nearly double the survival rate with the best chemo radiotherapy. And of course, it is impressive. It is very impressive that you double the survival, but it's not a miracle. If you live 12 months, you are very happy that you maybe can live 12 more, but it's not a miracle. The next slide I will show you is a miracle. This was on national TV just uh, the last month. We have in Denmark every year a campaign called Break Cancer Campaign. It's a war against cancer. And one of my friends and colleagues, uh, he was, um, he was Benny, is his name, he was in, in television telling about the history of oncology. He's retiring now. He was telling all that he have lived through. I mean, just think about testicular cancer, Hodgkin, people died from that, now how they live. And he had also some cases uh, that very surprisingly lived. And here is the miracle. This man appeared on the screen and he told his story. He's now 73 years old. In, in 2015, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. In 2017, he had metastasis to the liver. As of today, he is healthy and fresh and have no sign of disease. This is the CT scan from 17 with a liver metastasis. This is September now. So he is healthy. He doesn't have any disease. And what he had, what he had immunotherapy in combination with something to activate the immunotherapy. Now it turns out that maybe NanoKnife that I showed before, maybe NanoKnife was not saving patients with pancreatic cancer by itself. It could work, but it doesn't work because we need to something else. But nanonife may be the best uh, method to activate the immuno, uh, immunological system. So when you start with nanotherapy and then add immunotherapy, you might, you, we might find the miracle. So this is actually what we are uh, doing now. Nanonife, um, we do nanonife of one lesion and by doing nanonife of one lesion, you have something that is called an abscopal effect because you kill this lesion it will send out some transmitters that start killing the other lesions. And then you can boost the immunotherapy, uh, immunological system with immunotherapy. And the combination of these two probably will be able to help us solve this very, very bad enigma. And we have a PhD thesis going on in our hospital like this. And we hope, of course, it's going to be a miracle. So intervention has always been a Danish game and it will continue to be it. And uh, thank you for your attention and I've come to the end. Thank you very much, Christian. We can uh, afford one question from the floor. Is there anyone who wants to pose a question? We are also looking at the chat. There is still no questions in the chat. So maybe I can just, yeah, Gare, please. Thank you so much for this excellent presentation. It was very exciting. Uh, I wonder if uh, the nano knife is, is would you prefer that on uh, uh, liver metastasis as well uh, uh, instead of using traditional RFA? No, for liver metastasis, for a simple liver metastasis, I would not use nano knife. I would not use RF. I would use microwave. It is fast and it's simple and it's over within 15 minutes. The nano knife could be a good tool in liver metastasis. If you have a liver metastasis that is sitting in an angle between important vessels, like very close to the hilum, I can ablate that very easily. And then one week later, the patient dies because 
it only crotisizes and, uh, and also the bile ducts. So when they're sitting in a branch of important vital structures, nanolife is the way to do it. Otherwise, you cannot. But these are few, but there are some. Very okay, thank you very much, Christian. We need to move on. Our next speaker will be introduced by my co-chairman, Professor Roald Flesvan Havre. To welcome Dr. Christian Jensen from Germany, from a Hospital of Marisch in Oderland. And he is currently the president of the European uh, Society of Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology, EFSUM. And it's very nice that you had the opportunity to come to Bergen today uh, as one of very few international guests who were able to make it. And so please, uh, Dr. Christian Jensen, <coughs> um, you will talk about the CUS and ultrasound guided interventions. I have the same problem as Christian also with the number of my slides, of course, and therefore I decided to use my first slide to have the message of my um, lecture in one slide, and that is that contrast, that using contrast enhanced ultrasound to guide intervention improves success and avoids complications. In nearly every case you will use it, and we can use it in two ways. We can use it intravenously, uh, as usual, and we can use it endocavitary in several ways, and I will show you some examples. This is my agenda. First, I will introduce some diagnostic interventions, which are useful only for diagnosis or for planning of interventions. Then I uh, will go to biopsy, and I will tell you that not always it is wise to guide the biopsy, it can also be wise to avoid the biopsy. I will not refer to ablation because it has been done very, very good by, by Christian also. And I will tell you a third topic, interventional endocapitary ultrasound. First, diagnosis and planning. And I'm a gastroenterologist and therefore um, the problem of hepatic hydrothorax is one which is interesting for me. These are patients which have a small amount of ascites, they have a liver cirrhosis and they present with a large pleural effusion as shown in this case. And uh, we use, for example, this way to diagnose hepatic hydrothorax. We insert the needle into the small amount of ascites, inject a small amount of Sonoview diluted by saline and then we can have a clear decision. Is there any contrast, is there any micro bubble inside the pleural cavity on the right side, or is there only um, contrast medium inside the peritoneal cavity? This is peritoneal cavity, this is the level of the diaphragm, and there are a small amount of micro bubbles within the right pleural cavity and that means there's a connection. We can't see it with any imaging tool, but we can prove by injecting contrast. Um, another interesting um, use of contrast in diagnosis, but it's also interventional, is fistulography to, to show a, fistu a fistula between two compartments. And this one is a fistula between uh, the rectum and abscess, a perirectal abscess, and we can decide using these images on how to intervene, to have a drainage from outside, to a drainage from inside, and you, of course, can combine it with intravenous uh, ultrasound. Another example is proof of communication in the pancreas. We have a problem with cystic pancreatic lesions. We have 25 types of cystic pancreatic lesions, and only one of the neoplastic cysts have communication with the pancreatic duct. And you sometimes can see it very well with uh, endoscopic ultrasound, but in this case, there is no clear communication to be seen with this cyst to the pancreatic duct. And in this case, it was decided uh, to perform a puncture for diagnostic reasons to have aspiration of the fluid and uh, of some cells for cytological diagnosis, and in this case it was combi combined with uh, injection of Zonovu 
diluted sonar view into the cyst, and you can see very well in this image that now we can confirm that there's connection of the cyst with the pancreatic uh, duct, and this is delineation of the uh, whole um, cause of the main pancreatic duct. And this proves connection, and this is diagnosis. This is diagnosis of an intraductal uh, <coughs> mucinous neoplasia from branch duct type. This is not usual. You will only perform it if you have an indication for, for biopsy. And this I found in the literature, and I found it very interesting, uh, application in, in, in pediatric patients and neonates, diagnosis of bilgary atresia. And uh, in inconclusive cases, they used ultrasound combined with a uh, puncture of the small gallbladder to show a connection between the gallbladder and the bile ducts and the small intestine. And in this case, there was suspicion of bilgary atresia because of a triangular cord thickness of more than two millimeters and the not contracting gallbladder. And in this case, they could exclude atresia because there was a positive enterograde cholangiography and intestinos, uh, intestinography in this case. But there was another case, and this is a report, I think, of nine patients with a small gallbladder and with a triangular cord thickness of two millimeters, which is a cut-off value. And there is a negative anterograde Only the gallbladder has contrast inside. And I think this is a very interesting application because such a pediatric patient in this case doesn't need radiation to establish diagnosis or to exclude. Now, second topic is intravenous application of contrast for diagnosis and treatment. And there's some guidance by our EFSOM guidelines from 2015. And they tell us the same as uh, what was already uh, told by Christian Nolso, that soils, of course, with fusion, but also without fusion can be helpful to avoid necrotic areas in percutaneous biopsy of intraabdominal as well as pulmonary uh, tumors. Uh, and soils can be helpful in identifying biopsy targets which are not visible or poorly visible with fundamental B mode. And of course, we can use it uh, for guidance and follow up of um, of, of, of ablation procedures, not only ultrasound guided ablation, but also ablation using uh, the transarterial hemoembolization in the liver for HCC. My first point, not always do biopsy. You can avoid biopsy, and this is a very simple example of a uh, hypoechoic lesion behind the gallbladder within a slightly fatty liver. That can be all, it can be benign, it can be malignant, but uh, contrast enhanced ultrasound in this case shows clearly that this is hemangioma, and of course, in this case, you should and you can avoid uh, biopsy. Another, a little bit more complex example is this um, mass lesion uh, in the right lower quadrant, and it seems that. This may be cystic, but there's some material inside, and uh, there's a clear image, a clear diagnosis using contrast-enhanced ultrasound, because it shows you there's no vital tissue. It is clearly a cystic tumor, and this is, in this position, likely to be mucosal of the appendix. And of course, you should avoid biopsy, because this biopsy can, uh, can, can uh, lead to untreatable diffuse peritoneal pseudomyxoma depending from the, um, from the histological diagnosis of this um, mucosal. And another case with endoscopic ultrasound is bronchogenic cyst. <coughs> this patient was sent to us to biopsy this lymph node. It was described to be a lymph node in CT, in contrast CT. It is not uh, echo-free. Uh, but with contrast enhanced ultrasound, you see clearly that this is a cyst and biopsy is contraindicated. The only one contraindication for US guided biopsy 
the only absolute one because of life-threatening mediastinitis in more than 30% of cases. Um, now we come to guidance of biopsy and this, to my knowledge, was the first paper describing the use of contrast-enhanced ultrasounds for interventions of hepatic lesions which are invisible on conventional B mode and Klaus Schlottmann and his group from UNA and uh, I think he was at the university in Regensburg at this time. He first injected Zonovu to detect the lesions and to uh, decide on which lesion should be targeted uh, under CUS. And uh, of course, we have to plan the needle tract and uh, using a second injection of Zonovu, he uh, placed the needle within the target biopsy. And this is one of the um, videos from this study, or which are cited in the study, or referred to in the study. And you can see this is hypervascular lesion, which now is visible in the late phase and may be biopsied old images, but showing the principle. Um, and there are a lot of studies. I can show you only one. But this was important because it showed that especially for small liver lesions, which are which have a size below 20 millimeters, the accuracy for histologic or cytologic diagnosis is significantly higher uh, in patients in, which you, in, in, in whom you use uh, a SOIS-guided biopsy. And there's one example from Denmark, I think, courtesy of Torben Lorenz, a colleague, colleague of Christian Nolso, showing um, a partially necrotic lesion. There's only one viable smaller part of this lesion. And of course, it is very easy now to target this viable part of the lesion. And you can't see the viable part clearly uh, with B-mode ultrasound. Uh, dilated renal calyx cal system. And uh, you see that there is communication to the bladder. That means it's only a stricture, not an occlusion. And this is an own example of an intensive care patient with uh, acute renal failure and with obstruction of both ureters following surgery. And in this case, we used a contrast injection into the calyx system to guide the placement of two drainages of both kidneys um, uh, to treat the acute renal failure. And of course, as a gastroenterologist, we use uh, SOIS intracavitary intratubular for percutaneous cholangiography and drainage. Here you can see one example. It, is, it looks like fluoroscopy, and it substitutes in many cases, not completely, but uh, in follow-up, but al also in difficult, difficult situations at intensive care unit, uh, the application of fluoroscopy uh, and guides the needle, and the needle and catheter placement and placement in, in the biliary system and you will get nice cholangiographies as in this case. And of course, you can also show peritoneal leakage in this case of a PTCD catheter. It is inside, but, but you have some leakage of contrast medium. And this was an interesting case of an uh, oncological patient with a lot of chemotherapy received before and uh, an, an obstruction of the bile ducts. Of course, we can see there's correct placement of the drainage, but if we inject slowly, we inject it slowly and only a, a low amount of contrast medium with saline, we see retrograde contrast diffusion into the liver. And this was explanation why the patient, after, um, after flushing uh, the, the, the casita, which is routinely, routinely done in our department, developed in sometimes fever. And therefore, we avoided in the future to uh, make such uh, flushing. A last example is CUS guided vascular intervention. And I show you a dramatic example that in, in, in rare cases, this can be useful. This was a 50 year old man who had a pancreatic left resection and bleeding after we performed an US guided drainage of a delayed postoperative abscess. And some hours, I think 10 hours after uh, this procedure, patient developed a severe uh, gastrointestinal bleeding. You see the drainage inside and the 
uh, stomach is full of blood and the patient was in shock and we stabilized the patient and in the morning we performed endoscopic ultrasound. Here is a residual abscess, this drainage, and here is a source of bleeding, which is a small pseudoaneurysm of the splenic artery. And uh, we decided first to perform an uh, intravenous injection of contrast agent. This is endoscopic ultrasound. The transducer is here, and we are in the upper part of the stomach at the posterior wall, and afterwards, we, uh, we targeted this pseudo aneurysm with a standard aspiration needle and injected a mixture of a very small amount of, um, of, of Zonovu with a uh, um, bovine thrombine solution. And this was to guide the uh, velocity of injection. Uh, we, we wanted to avoid damage to the spleen uh, and uh, performed it very slowly uh, under control of contrast injection into the aneurysm. And you see that there's sometimes a very small amount of this mixture going into the splenic artery here and a little bit into the cavity, which was the source of bleeding. And this was su successful because on the next day we saw that the um, pseudo aneurysm, which was here is completely excluded. This is the, the splenic artery, which is curved in this case, and this was successful in technical and in clinical terms. I come to my conclusion. First, I wanted to show you that contrast-enhanced ultrasound facilitates tailored solutions for various interventional problems, and that is the reason that we have not so big studies. We have case studies, we have uh, um, a collections of seven or five cases in some times and only for biopsy we have some valid prospective studies. Of course you can see much more with contrast enhanced ultrasound than with uh, B-mode ultrasound and color Doppler and you know that you can puncture and intervene everything you can see and if you see more you can puncture and intervene more but you can avoid also not necessary and dangerous intervention using contrast-enhanced ultrasound. And you can use it as a substitute for fluoroscopy, as an extra cavitary application. You can use it for bedside interventions instead of fluoroscopy. You can use it for follow-up at any time. And you also can detect complications or malpositions and so on. And if you use it intravenously, you can use it uh, as a microvascular imaging tool for differentiation between viable and not viable parts of a tumor to avoid tumor necrosis and to identify vital residual tumor tissue after ablation, for example. And you can use it macrovascular as a substitute for angiography without nephrotoxicity and to uh, guide some uh, rare vascular intervention, as I have shown. Let's celebrate your anniversary, but <laughs> join us to celebrate also the 50th anniversary of EFSOM next year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jansson, for this uh, excellent uh, lecture. Uh, first, I have to apologize for our online audience. We have some lag between the speak and the speech and the picture sometimes, and uh, there seems to be uh, sometimes a problem with the, uh, the videos. So uh, we have a, a, in the chat uh, an advice how to to uh, restore the the running of the video or, uh, by pressing Control R or uh, uh, Command R in, in the Mac. So I, I want to ask you, it's really uh, nice how to see how you can uh, apply the contrast, uh, not in an intravenous administration, but also to confirm the, the um, passage between compartments. And even in, in cases where you can't find uh, the, um, the fistula, because mm -hmm. fistulas can be very yeah. small and, and very hard to see in any imaging mm -hmm. method. So this is an excellent way to to visualize the connection between uh, compartments. So that was, was very uh, interesting to see. But 
There was a, a question in the chat about this administration uh, that of Sonovu into not uh, uh, intravenously administrated, but uh, using it in uh, in other uh, injecting it mm. into cysts or into abscesses. Mm. Do you have any second thoughts uh, about doing this? Uh, could it be harmful in any way? Yeah, there. Are as I mentioned, there are not so large studies, but up to now, from all centers who perform intracavitary ultrasound, there is no message on, on, on side effects. Of course, if we inject something into a tubular system, like the biliary system, I always use uh, prevention of infection, and you should always have a very good indication for injecting in, in, in into tubular structures, for example, in the pancreatic duct. And I would never do it only for uh, having a diagnosis by showing communications. But in this case, as I have showed, there was an indication for puncturing uh, and to aspirate fluid for a cytological diagnosis because the patient wanted to know how to proceed operation um, in, in I'm not aware of any complications with endocavitary use of contrast enhanced ultrasound. Christian, do you have any information? Yeah, it is I was not. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, I think we have to move on. Yeah, okay. Thank yeah. you very much for your very interesting mm. talk. <laughs> and our final speaker in this uh, first session is Dr. He's also a PhD student uh, right now, working on advanced uh, intervention in the esophagus using both endoscopy and ultrasound. And he will now talk about uh, EUS-guided biliary excess and interventions. And let me also add that uh, Dr. Farm has recently received a great prize, the Innovation Prize of Western Norway, for all his uh, hard and very courageful work on new intervention in the GI systems. He uh, often speaks of himself as a plumber, being able to bridge all kinds of vascular structures, GI structures, and biliar structures inside the body. So far, we are very pleased to have you talking about this uh, topic today, please. Thank you for the invitation. <coughs> Well, these are my disclosures. Okay, so um, <coughs> as you already probably know, uh, um, ERC is the main uh, method to drain bile ducts. It is a well, very well known uh, method, and um, it, it's, it has a a lot of uh, advantages, but it requires that you have to pass uh, instruments into the duodenum, and then you need to pass instruments through the papilla. papilla. Uh, the there's a bunch of uh, disadvantages. Is that um, the most common side effect of adverse events from uh, ERT? Um, pancreatitis. Um, but in even in best hands, there's a failure a rate up to 10%. Uh, it's because you might have a tumor which obstructs the duodenum, or you, you have problem to, to access the papilla. So when you fail with ERCP, the next step you is that you might try to go for percutaneous drainage, uh, which has a very high success rate, but it has a bunch of adverse events and up to uh, more than 70% adverse event uh, rate with the fistula formation, uh, infection, clogging, dislodging of, uh, of the, the catheter. It gives a lot of pain to the patients and a lot of discomfort. You, you also um, have to, to drain the bile uh, outside of the bile, use the bile uh, physiologically. Um, and uh, it, it is also contraindicated in case of uh, ascites um, where patients are removing the catheter 
by itself. I'm a little uh, uncertain, <laughs> uncertain about the, the technical uh, uh, issues here with this uh, PowerPoint, but uh, I need to combine. It's uh, some kind of lag here. It uh, doesn't react uh, to the, to the um, buttons. Because it's not the same what I see there. Mm. Yeah, I see. <coughs> no, it's this yeah. But for the moment, it's that one. Which is still yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now. now it's probably, hopefully, better. Yeah. So, if you fail with uh, uh, percutaneous mm -hmm. drainage, then um, you can might offer the patient. Um, surgical decompression. <coughs> and in that case, you might uh, need uh, to do a, uh, a rearrangement of the abdominal. Uh, uh, typically, uh, entero uh, biliary anastomosis. But it is often a serious uh, procedure which might cause mortality. So that's where EOS biliary drainage uh, comes in. And it is an alternative for. To, to percutaneous and surgical um, procedure, and it's a it's a it's a method we apply now for ERCP uh, success rate. Uh, in studies, uh, the clinical success rate of uh, EUS guided uh, biliary drainage is uh, very comparable to uh, percutaneous, um, but the complication rate is uh, much lower, and also cause less pain to the patient. And it is much more comfortable for the patient because the you have an automatic drainage system into the into the bowel, and you can also use uh, the the bile physiologically. And another advantage is that the patient um, do not need to handle uh, external drains and uh, bags. And there are <coughs> few routes which we prefer to use. It's um, so one of the routes it's a uh, Integrate from the stomach. So you, s you, you have an endoscope in the stomach, you puncture the, the, the bile ducts in the left liver, typically in segment two or three. And they, then you try to advance the guide wire through the uh, common bile duct and through the papilla and down to the duodenum to have an, an access into the left liver or anti-grade uh, transpapillary. Uh, you c if you have that access, you can drain directly into the stomach also. There are new routes now. Is that one option is that you you can access from the into the common bile duct and then place a guide wire through the papilla and do an anti-grade stenting or or or, uh, or um, rendezvous. But uh, uh, the latest development is now you can do a direct uh, access to the to the gallbladder from the antrum or the the duodenum, and so you have some different options if you use uh, EUS guided uh, drainage. But <coughs> it is should not be a compensation for bad uh, ERCP skills. It is, uh, it is a, a dangerous uh, group of procedure which can cause uh, bile leakage, sepsis and, and worst case mortality. So it is a citation from uh, an article I found. It is uh, It should be in a in a in skill hand, which is who is able to perform both EUS and and ERCP and assistance, because you often you need to use long wide solutions, and then you always need a consent because it's a high high risk procedure. And there's a bunch of tools you also know them pretty well. The needle, it's a personal preference what kind of needle you use, but usually a 19 gauge needle so that you can puncture <coughs> into the bile ducts <coughs> and inject contrast. Then you place a, a guide wire and then you need a ring knife or a cystic stone and a dilatator or a balloon to, to guide wire to access the area of interest. And then you do the dilatation and then from there the, 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 the path differ depends on depending on a kind of uh, clinical situation you have. <coughs> you can do transintestinal drainage directly, you can do anti-grade uh, drainage, 
you, you, you can do uh, rendezvous procedures. And then recently also a procedure we, we, we um, tested here is called the uh, random rendezvous, uh, tandem rendezvous, I will show you later. Or and then you, you can use uh, any stance you want to, to drain further. So <coughs> this is a picture of what we can expect. So we are, we are in the stomach, we are looking uh, into the, uh, on the left liver, we, we find the dilated bile ducts. And these are very good targets. So we can see that we don't need a Doppler. We can see it's a dilated bile duct. And then we <coughs> try to puncture with a needle. And then this is a process where, just to show you how, how we do it, because uh, you, you have a needle, you have, uh, you have put a contrast. In this case, we, we have, we're using endoscopic ultrasound. And then we are we are playing around with the guide wire to access the duodenum. In this case, there was a surgical resect resected papilla, so there was stapled line here, and it was uh, extremely difficult to to, uh, to puncture into the duodenum. And so, if you have an, an access to the left uh, liver, so the the f the, f the first easy um, procedure, is so-called the EUS ERCP rendezvous. So in this case, you had a was a with a it was a case with a pancreatic cancer in the head of the pancreas, and it was not possible to to advance the guide wire uh, uh, to the to the um, um, past this the, the the stricture tumor stricture, and so by using EUS you can access the left liver, then you can place the guide wire uh, through the papilla, and then you 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 tr you sh shift over to uh, ERCP scope. And then you, you catch the guide wire, and then you can place a stent uh, um, on top of the guide wire. And this is the, a classical uh, EUS ERCP uh, rendezvous procedure. And this is a, a new procedure we, we tried uh, earlier this year. Uh, we had a case with a staplet papilla, so there was no pancreatic and the biliary orifice. And when we start to, to access the left liver and, and manage to get the guide wire through the, the staplet line, we had problem with pushability of the stents. So in that case, we, we, we used a second endoscope, an uh, ultra-slim endoscope. We caught the guide wire and then we made a complete uh, loop, rendezvous. And then by pulling the guide wire with this, the, the, the ultra-slim scope, we could push the... the, the the um, the the stent uh, through the stapled lines. So this is uh, to to make uh, to reestablish uh, 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 orifice to the uh, from the coma bioduct into the um, to the stapled duodenum. And so is here you see a, a very unique pictures where we have a, a, a we have two different scopes inside the patient, and when we pull the 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 um, ultra slim scope, and then at the same time we try to push the, the force the, the the stent metallic stent through the stapled line. And one of the the, m the more common procedures we do uh, in case when you don't have uh, access to the to the um, to the um, common bile duct anymore, then we could just uh, inject contrast to the left liver, and then we just place a stent. So you can stand directly, uh, and this stand we cover the whole bile tree, and both left and right side will be drained into the stomach. So this is a hepatico gastrostomy, and typical indication in, in our institution is a pancreatic uh, cancer, the head of the pancreas, and, and the second most common is the metastatic cancer to the liver hilum. And uh, we also done on the cholangic carcinomas and um, in one case with uh, interductal papillary neoplasm of the bile duct. We have also uh, performed on uh, benign indication, like alcoholic pancreatitis, but uh, later we re regret it. But anyway, uh, with the hepatic acystome, you have very high uh, uh, technical success rate and clinical success rate. It's a very superior compared to all the kind of uh, biliary drainage, but you have to be aware that this there has a over overall adverse event rates at over more than 20 percent. And in worst case, you have mortality, and uh, so that's why we we 
we should, uh, it, this procedure should be only performed by a very skilled endoscopist uh, with adequate backup. The complication is typically that you, you uh, the, the stand you place, it's uh, overdimensionalized compared to the, the native uh, bile duct, so you, it can erode to the hepatic artery and cause massive bleeding. And the, the worst complication is when you, you misdeploy the stent, you can uh, misdeploy the stent into peritoneum and then suddenly you, you have a bile leakage into the peritoneum. Uh, we can use the hepatic gastrostomy as a diagnostic tool. So in this case, there, there was um, an obstruction of the, of the, um, of the uh, bile ducts in the hilum. We could not uh, pass any instrument to take any biopsy or do a diagnostic, but thanks to uh, hepatic gastrostomy, we could go through it with uh, an autostim uh, scope, and then we could see the papillary structure of um, I IP and B. This is a, a, uh, an example of how we can use uh, uh, hepatic gastrostomy in case of a huge metastatic ovarian cancer, which obstructs both left and right side of the liver. And uh, in that case, y we can expect that ERCP will be more or less impossible. It's a, uh, if you want to drain in this kind of case, you need a, a catheter on both left and right side of the liver, so it costs, uh, you need two drains, and usually it's a very discomfortable for, for the patients. So in that case, we, we, uh, we, can s uh, we, we try to, to drain the first the left liver uh, with a hepatic gastrostomy. So here we, we are in the stomach, we puncture the, the left liver, uh, enter the uh, uh, the, the, the left sided uh, bile ducts. And you can see the contrast stop uh, when it comes to the hilum. And then we, we, we can sometimes, we are lucky, and then we could advance the gadwire from the left to the right. So you can actually bridge the drainage from the right to the left into the stomach. But because of this huge tumor, uh, we, we could only, uh, uh, we could not pass the, the tumor and then in that case, we didn't have any more options. Since you already start the procedure, you, you cannot allow to stop. So you have to continue until uh, you have managed to drain. Otherwise, you have a catastrophe. So in that case, we, we, uh, we, was we, we just decided to put uh, a, a stent to, to make anastomosis from the left liver into the, to the stomach. So it, it relieves the drainage on the left side. The problem is on the right side. And this is the first time we, we describe uh, that we, we go from the, from the duodenum, we could puncture to the right liver, and then you, are in, in, uh, you can place a, a, a guide wire. And then in the same fashion, you dilate, and then you, 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 uh, you place a, a another stent. And this is probably the first case in the world where, which is where we describe that it's possible to drain both left and the and the right side of the liver in one and the same procedure. Um, so this, this procedure is uh, called the uh, EOS-guided hepaticoduronostomy. And in this case, the patient, she, she had a 14 uh, uh, lines of chemotherapy, but you see you, you could drain uh, the whole uh, liver and then we see that uh, the bilirubin just uh, went down and until she died, uh, as long as we, could, we had a follow-up, uh, the bilirubin was normal. This is an um, <coughs> uh, interesting case with uh, IPNB, where you have an infiltration of a cancer on both left and right side plus the common bile duct, so it's totally obstructing the, 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 the bilirubin drainage. So in that case, we needed to do and as a radio frequency of the common bile duct to uh, recanalize uh, through the tumor. And then we had a, a percutaneous drain, and then we used the same catheter uh, on to, to, uh, to recanalize on the right side. But then the patient also ha had a, um, a hepatic gastrostomy to access the, the left liver, and through that we also made ablation. So this, this is a, a triple... Um, directional um, RFA. So um, <coughs> another procedure to, to drain the, 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 the bile duct is it's in case, for example, 
here's we had a, a, a tumor, a metastatic breast cancer, obstructing the distal common bile duct. So we, we could have done a hepatic gastrostomy, but in this case we, we just use a lumen opposing metallic stance, which is, uh, has a an direct introducer. You just uh, burn the, the whole stent into the common bile duct, and then you can uh, you can release the. Um, that was I could not do so much, with it. but then you you release the, this uh, lumen opposing metallic stent, and then you have a direct <coughs> anastomosis to the common bile duct. Okay. Um, here's a case where um, um, uh, we we had a we tried to make a direct access to the to the bile duct. So uh, we first we the we injected contrast into the bile duct, and then we we placed a, a lumen uh, opposing metallic stent to make uh, anastomosis from the duodenum into the gallbladder. And it's a an old lady nearly 90 years old who, who had um, multiple cholecystitis due to uh, uh, gallstones. And so you can see pus coming out from the gallbladder. And then <coughs> you just dilate up to the working as a diameter, which is 10 millimeter in this case. And you could, you could suck out the, the small uh, gallstones from the gallbladder. And then if you, uh, if you use an ultra slim endoscope, you can go through the the, the lumen opposing metallic stent into the gallbladder, and then we, we found in this case a huge uh, uh, gallstones, more than uh, three centimeter, in which we use electrohydrolithotripsy to, to break down, uh, to fragmentize in three sessions before uh, we could go inside the gallbladder and see it, uh, that it's uh, clean. And this is the, s the, the opening of the cystic duct. And then after we have cleaned uh, everything, then we could remove the, the lumen opposing metallic stent. So this is a, an, an optional treatment for a patient who has a chronic cholecystitis um, who are not operable. And even in, in, um <coughs> in alternate anatomy, for example, Ru and I anatomy, it is possible to, to reestablish the, the normal anatomy by using a lumen opposing metallic stent to shorten the, 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 the road for, for ERCP procedures. Because the, you, 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 you can, um, it's, it's very cumbersome to use an uh, uh, enteroscope uh, to, to, uh, to access the, the, the papilla with this kind of anatomy. Um, there have also been descri described uh, that you can use a temporary um, hepatic gastrostomy to, to uh, access the common bile duct to, for example, to break uh, stones or to remove uh, stones, uh, anti-grade rather than uh, trans uh, tra through the uh, uh, normal uh, retrograde uh, route. And then, for example, in this case, you, you can see the that it's a, it's a covered metallic stent used as a temporary access into the left liver, where you can access uh, with uh, with uh, catheter and, and uh, instrumentation for uh, for stone removal, and so you don't need to even to pass uh, through the papilla. So, in conclusion, the uh, EUS guided biliary drainage there are, there's a n it's a name for for heterogeneous uh, group of procedures. Uh, it's consisting of different level of diffic difficulty and complexity but it, it gives you a lot of uh, flexibility and you can do a lot of acrobatic uh, and combine with many new therapy. And it's, it's often a new way of thinking how to access the bile duct. And uh, you can use this uh, as an access to do other kind of therapy like lithotripsy or, or, or RFA. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Farm, for a very impressive lecture. The sky is the limit here. Yeah. Any questions, please, comments from the floor? Yes, Trygva. Well, I'm um, very interested in uh, procedures you are doing. And maybe it's the same for all these uh, in the, the presentation in this section. That maybe you have a lot of complicated uh, procedures you are doing, a lot of complicated techniques you are doing, 
a lot of very difficult equipment. Do you need some planning for doing that? Is there a group together with a pathologist or surgeons that you're planning it, or do you it all things below you have to take the decision immediately when you're there? No, it's a lot of improvisation because sometimes you, you, as you don't know how it goes before you really start. Because at the moment you inject uh, the contrast to make a cholangiogram, for example, for bilary drainage, then you s see what kind of the problems it really is. And then you have to think in an overall situation for the patient. Uh, how do you prolong life or increase the quality of life uh, as much as possible and not just to drain to for draining? I mean, there's no problem for me to drain, but I want to drain so that the patient lives as long as possible without maintenance or that he has to come back to, to fix uh, further. So it's like playing chess. You have to be one step ahead all the time. Yeah. We have no questions in the chat, but Roald has a question, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's obvious that this is not for everyone, but uh, so it uh, takes a lot of skills uh, also to be able to improvise. When you put uh, this uh, lumina posing stent either into the uh, gallbladder or you do it uh, to access uh, a different bowel loop like in the Ru and E uh, anatomy. Do you leave it in place for some weeks uh, or do you remove it immediately uh, uh, during the same procedure? Uh, you should not remove in the same procedure because it's, uh, you need uh, at least uh, 10 days or to two weeks before you have a, 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 a stable anastomosis. So if you remove, then you have a dislo you have a this hinge, so these two hollow organs. Mm. Also, for example, in gallbladder uh, case, we, we, we leave the the the, the lumen opposing metallic stunts until the job is done, and then you remove. I mean, if you remove and then there's still stones in the gallbladder, then it will not work. The patient will come back. Mm. Yeah. So you see this patient repeatedly then. Yeah, until uh, there's no more stones. And then you can give contrast in the gallbladder. You can see that the contrast pass freely uh, into the cystic duct and the common bile duct, and there, there's no more traces of stones in the cystic duct and the gallbladder, and then you are satisfied. And then you can remove. And um, <coughs> typically, this, this um, fistula will grow by itself. Mm. OK, thank you. Once again, Dr. Farm, for a very impressive lecture, and we are very curious to see when the, where the acrobatics will take you next time.